Good afternoon once again. Yesterday, I followed a horse-drawn hearse under police escort down a country road across a state highway and then up a steep path through a meadow to a high ridge overlooking the Walnut Creek Valley. Wyman Wangard was a quiet but influential man uh, in the community for many years as demonstrated by the fact that I went to the viewing the night before. He's the father of um, a business owner friend of mine in the community. I had a thousand people there um, in the evening. I, I made the mistake of um, waiting until 6.30 to go there. I had thought about, the, uh, they have visitation from 10 o'clock in the morning until uh, 8 o'clock in the evening. And at the funeral, uh, there were 500 people, 50 grandchildren and uh, 14 great-grandchildren, uh, just a fine man who, um, whose life has had an impact. Following that hearse reminded me of um, another hearse I followed on September 5th, 2004, along Route 80 west to Gladewater, Texas, to the Memorial Park, where we laid a man that some of you may remember, Mr. Ray Dick, Joe is nodding his head, to rest on a hot Texas afternoon. Family and friends and neighbors gathered to bestow their final respects to a life well lived. If you ever knew Mr. Dick, wherever he was, with whomever he came into contact with, it wasn't very long until the uh, topic of the kingdom of God, the work of the church, and our destiny would ultimately dominate the conversation. Uh, Mr. Dick was a interesting guy. I came to, got to know him when I was at Ambassador University. He lived in the apartment upstairs and soon adopted me as a wayward grandson that he spent his time trying to uh, get on the right course. I called him a few weeks before his death to um, bid him farewell. He uh, actually had you know, moved around the world. Uh, his last assignment for the church was in Jerusalem, uh, Israel, during and leading up to the first Gulf War. And Mr. Dukaj forced him to come home. Mr. Dick was irate. He said, it, just when it's starting to happen, they bring me home. He had no um, concern about his welfare at all. He was going to miss something exciting in Israel, and he was forced to come home and then ultimately retired. And I don't think he ever forgave uh, administration for forcing him to do that. I'm just uh, giving you a little bit of a picture into the, um, the individual's attitude and mind and enthusiasm for the kingdom of God. When I called him a few weeks before his death to bid him farewell, we had a positive conversation and, and the conversation came right back to what, what it normally did, the prophecies of the future, the fall holy days, and then he delivered his well-rehearsed sermon to John Miller on what I should do and what I shouldn't do and why I'm not doing enough and you could do more and you should be doing this. And um, so we had a good conversation and he knew his time had come and I, I said, Grandpa, I might come to call him that. Um, I said, near the conclusion of our conversation, I said, I will see you again. And he responded by saying, that's a deal. And he said it was the same kind of certainty as if I had said, look, Grandpa, I'm getting on a plane next week. I'm coming out to Texas to, to see you. Thus, a relationship that I had come to cherish was uh, prepared for an interlude that would commence with his death a few weeks later. Mr. Ray Dick, as many before him, now awaits what the Bible calls a better resurrection. And we will celebrate a week from Monday the Feast of Trumpets, which symbolizes, among other things, that event. But this afternoon, I want to focus our attention as we go towards the Fall Holy Days. This is kind of a Feast of Trumpets sermon ahead of trumpets. I want to focus our attention on 
just how much better this resurrection is going to be. We will begin our journey in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 chronicles the lives of faithful down through millennia. I mean, I, I find the, 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 the chapter 11 of Hebrews to be a most inspiring account because of several aspects. One, of course, are the enormous exploits that these individuals did down through time, I mean, the whole chronicle from the patriarchs um, on, dime, on down to the New Testament, and of course, um, it will be continued, I believe, in the future with the exploits of individuals, some of which we may have known, um, what they did. But that's only a portion of it. I mean, the great exploits, the heroism, the huge sacrifice, you know, it, it's, it's ironic, isn't it? That it is heroism and huge sacrifice that we somehow, everybody somehow respects it, but none of us really want to do it. I mean, that's, it's a lot better to observe a hero than to be one. Um, but coming back to what inspires me about Hebrews chapter 11 is the fact that they were ordinary and flawed individuals like you and I. They shared in common a undying faith that took them through whatever the world and life through at them. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, and I'll just read a couple of verses here, beginning in verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. I mean, the, the Israelites marched in a big circle all the way around the uh, city of Jericho. And you think about it, as many people as they were, they probably pretty much uh, formed a, a complete circle all the way around. Verse 31, by faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had, been re had received the spies with peace. Now notice here, you know, what would have been wrong to sanitize this a little bit? You know, this is after all the hall of faith. Why not just say, by faith, Rahab did not perish. Why, why put in that word harlot? Okay, the world's oldest profession. Continuing, and what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, Stop the mouth of lions. And again, this is, as I mentioned, these are exploits of heroes, her heroes of faith. Verse 34, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again. I mean, the resurrection, the resurrections, I should say, in the New Testament was not a New Testament event entirely. Resurrections back to physical life occurred in the Old Testament as well. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. So here we have that comment the promise and the compelling vision of a resurrection that is better. So the question is, why? And we might also look at, I mean, if you think about it, so compelling was the vision of the kingdom of God, the city that they saw from afar off, so entrenched was the dream that, the, that even the offer of deliverance in a time of duress could not dissuade them from their course. And I've been uh, looking at a, things that people prayed for and don't have the results quite done yet. Maybe it'll turn into a sermon someday. But what I can tell you, just in having reviewed 
200 of the 347 scriptures in the Bible that refer to prayer is that right at the top is deliverance. People praying for deliverance. And yet here we have the heroes of faith who did not accept deliverance because they were waiting for a promise of a better resurrection. So in the time we share this afternoon, I'd like to look at various aspects of this particular resurrection that the Bible calls better and see what it was, what is it about this resurrection that makes it so desirable? What is it about this resurrection that makes it so glorious? So the first one, first uh, differentiator is, or the maybe I should uh, state it this way, is the fact that an angelic trumpet heralds its advent while Jesus Christ leads the charge to change the world. It is the resurrection, as I mentioned earlier, is only one aspect of what the Feast of Trumpets symbolizes. But it is part of a package that will forever change the world as we know it and as it has been known. Those who have fallen asleep will awake at this turning point of history to see a better world emerge under the leadership of Jesus Christ. And the leadership of Jesus Christ is completely different from what we see and experience today at all different levels. Even those of us that try or attempt servant leadership, if you want to call it that, or the leadership in a godly form only do it at best uh, very badly. Let's look at Revelation chapter 11. This is a scripture we will no doubt hear on the Feast of Trumpets, but I think, you know, we've, we, we had the Feast of Pentecost, we had all summer. And now it's time to kind of shift gears over thinking about which direction. I have another sermon that um, I thought about giving but didn't, so I'll just give you a, a, a snippet of it. That is entitled, Are You Going to Reap? Are You Going to Reap? You know, so what does that mean? You have the same phrase <laughs> twice. So the question is, when we go to the feast, are we going there prepared to harvest? It is, after all, a harvest festival. Have we prepared for that? Or are we just going to go there to get whatever we can get? It's a question that is worth asking. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15 says this. Then the seventh angel sounded. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That announcement, that proclamation, even in just its concise description, shows that it is a world-changing event. Ownership transfers. The kingdoms of this world under the leadership, or should we say the misleadership, of today will be transferred, the title will transfer to, because it says here that they will become the kingdoms, plural, of our Lord and of his Christ. And it will go on forever and ever. That's a long time. We, those who have the Spirit of Christ in them, will participate, we will be there to be part of that proclamation. I mean, that's one of the reasons why it's better. I mean, it's better to be part of that than to come in one of the other resurrections later, which we will see in a moment. Let's go over to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 
First Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 13, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. I mean, the hope of a resurrection of life hereafter is a huge motivating, a huge motivator, but is also a source of comfort, lest we sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's how he brings those who sleep in Jesus, as it says here, with him. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. I mean, I remember this scripture. It's always a little bit confusing on how you go to heaven and then also get resurrected, but that's beside the point. My grandfather died when I was relatively young. I think he was eight years old. And um, I remember having this uh, kind of picture in my head. Um, well, first I'll tell you the scene, and then I'll tell you about the picture. So I remember really well the funeral because, you know, we went up, as we did yesterday, to the top of a hill to a hand-dug grave. It's a pine box lowered my grandfather down into a hand drug grave and then um, took shovels and covered him up, which, you know, for an eight-year-old was a dramatic scene. And that still being done, I mean, yesterday, um, it was interesting. You had the pallbearers who took their turn um, uh, shoveling. And then the entire, I think, just about all the uh, grandsons who were uh, old enough to participate um, helped, as it were, uh, bury Grandpa. But that was the scene. What I remember, the picture I remember in my mind was this idea that I had heard from you know, this scripture of those graves breaking open and people rising up into the sky. And just, it was, it's just a picture that I had in my mind in, you know, just from what I knew. That is a compelling scene, what Paul describes here. That you have, as you read, as we read in um, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15, that the, those who are alive will change in composition, if you will. And those who ha are dead, have decayed, will come back to life, break open the, the graves, and rise to meet the Lord in the air. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19 describes the coming, or as we could go to Zechariah, talks about the fact that, you know, when, when you go up and meet somebody, or when you go out to meet somebody, and they're coming in your direction, generally what happens is if I go meet them, they keep coming in this direction. So you meet the Lord in the air, and in Revelation chapter 19, we find a description of what happens then. Verse 11. <clears throat> then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Those are the saints that are with him, coming in the clouds. So, again, as I mentioned, when the angels make that proclamation 
of the title of governance transferring from the governance that we have today to Jesus Christ, we are to participate in that. Verse 15, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword with that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God, and he has a on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You know, when we, when we think about the millennial reign of Christ, I think we tend to look into the future and we see lambs dwelling with lions, we see abundance, we see all of those things that will be. However, however, we have to remember when you read this description that that's not how it starts. That's not how it starts. The world will be in worse shape than it ever has been at this juncture because of the destruction that man and then ultimately God brought upon it um, in the battle to transfer ownership. It's, I think, something to think about. This resurrection is better because it is a resurrection to a better life in a better world that we will need to rebuild. We just went through topics for the Feast of Tabernacles. My sermon that I'm giving on the second day is entitled... <clears throat> Rebuilding a broken world. Rebuilding a broken world. The second reason that this resurrection is better is because it is the first of a series of resurrections. And we'll notice some of the better points if you'll turn, while well, we're already there, we're, we're in Revelation chapter 20. And we read in verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they who sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. The first and the quote-unquote better resurrection. Let's just notice some of the reasons why this resurrection is better that are enumerated in this particular verse. It is, they, it, they are called blessed. Blessed are those. Holy. And if we read on down, well, we'll read, let me read on down and then I'll enumerate because we, we um, I didn't read as far as I had intended to initially. In verse 6, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such... The second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. Blessed, holy, second death has no power. Rulership in the form of kings and priests of God. Is that better than experiencing the second death? or missing that entire time period. You know, we, we often say, or Christ said, the first shall be the last, and the last shall be the first. Um, and, you know, you see, that, you see that happen. But this is a case where being first is better. Being first 
being in the first resurrection is better. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now you're all thinking, okay, I knew this was coming. I knew this was coming. No, no sermon about a resurrection would be complete without going to 1 Corinthians 15. So you can, you can stop listening now. But, but if, 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 just in case, let me read the, the introduction to 15. Here's what we often, I think, don't get as far as the, the context. You know, Paul was a passionate man. You know, you imagine you getting involved with Paul. I mean, I think he'd be pretty energetic, passionate guy, and he's kind of a fist-pounding type individual. Uh, if you read his letters, he's always, always trouble, you know. <laughs> and he's responding to trouble, and he's abrading, and, uh, and this is no exception. Um, notice verse 3, For I delivered to you first of all that which I had received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose on, uh, again the third day according to the scripture, and that he was seen by Cephas and by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain at present, but some have fallen asleep. So, he, why, is, why is Paul writing about all of this? I mean, 500 brethren, most of which at the writing to the Corinthians were still alive. I mean, the, the, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. He was raised from the dead, and it wasn't just a couple people that met him after he had been raised, over 500. I mean, that is a huge number of witnesses. But the reason Paul is saying this is the same reason we might say it today. There are people, a whole lot of people, who poo-poo the notion that Jesus Christ was resurrected at all. This is not a new phenomenon. This was going on right back in Corinth already. Notice, verse 12, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? You have 500 witnesses, plus more. And there were still people saying there is no resurrection. So it should not surprise us 2,000 years hence that many people think, you know, the resurrection of Jesus, well, I mean, it just... Never happened. It was just a, you know, the, 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 the disciples just took his body and hid it and started this rumor, you know. How many of you would be, uh, raise your hands, how many of you would be willing to die for a rumor? You know it's not true, right? You might spread a rumor, but you're not going to die for it, right? That was what was going on, I'm, I'm just pointing this out as we discuss the resurrection, that it should not surprise us that many people don't believe it today, 2,000 years later. It is one of the most well-documented events in history. Verse 20, so that was, let me just talk about that so that you stay awake for the really boring part here, which you all know. Verse 20, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so, in Christ all shall be made alive. This connects and is consistent with the statement back, the statement of Christ back in John chapter 5, where he said, the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave shall hear his voice and come forth. Some to the resurrection of life and some to the resurrection of condemnation. I mean, I'd rather be in the resurrection to life, wouldn't you? I mean, that's one of the reasons. I mean, being resurrected to life is much better than being resurrected to be condemned. Don't you think? Here's... 
in verse 23, we notice that Paul intimates what John would later document in a really clear framework, that there is more than one resurrection. Notice here, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ the first fruit, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. I mean, that's the differentiator. The big differentiator is whether or not you are Christ. If you look at Romans chapter 8, you are Christ if you have his Holy Spirit dwelling in you when you die. Being in this order, one of those who are Christ at his coming makes the first resurrection better. Point number three. This resurrection is better because it is a resurrection to immortality. I mean, right now, we are very mortal individuals. At least I am. And you pinch yourself. And you find out that you're very mortal flesh and blood individuals today. This takes the vision to a completely new level. Not only is the enemy of death overcome by a return to life. You know, you would think that is pretty good. I mean, it is. The enemy death is overcome by a return to life. Rather, it is a resurrection to an entirely different type of life. Immortality, incorruption, it constrain contrast power to weakness and sp the spiritual to the natural this reality takes on dimensions where the term better is actually incapable of describing what it actually will be what i'm telling you is that while hebrews says that these individuals refused to be delivered i mean they did not recant their faith under duress because they were waiting for a better resurrection. What I'm saying is, just for the uh, sake of argument this afternoon, is I believe if you look at what is better about this resurrection, is that better is an inadequate term to really describe it. But, you know, what else are you going to say other than better? Paul does a wonderful job describing the contrast of the resurrection here in the chapter that we find ourselves in. You know, again, I'll, I'll back up just for a moment. Verse 15, yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have, if there is no, I mean, their preaching would be in vain and they're testifying falsely. Yes, we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. So Paul is drawing this contrast and building the argument. You know, here we have 500, 500 witnesses that are still alive, most of them. But there were people then that were already denying. They were already denying the very event that enables a better resurrection, not only for Christ, but also for you and I. And he says here, if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. I mean, he's going at this like the lawyer he was. You know, he, 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 Paul understood how to make a compelling argument. And he's saying, look, you know, if there is no resurrection, then Jesus Christ didn't rise. And there are 500 people over here that said he did because they met him. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. 
you know, if this isn't true, then, you know, if you look at the life of the apostles, it would have been a really foolish thing for them to do. It would have been better to go back to the fishing business where they came from. So I think the evidence here is pretty compelling. 500 people? You only need two or three witnesses to convict someone in the Old Testament to death. You don't need 500 witnesses in a court today, do you, to convict somebody? You need credible witnesses, one or two, usually two. We have 500 witnesses to what we're about to read about this better resurrection. Let's go over to verse 35. But someone will say, and this is to someone, you know, everybody, someone, everybody, nobody, somebody, you know, I was used to, you know, the, the, those are the people I've wanted to hire for years, you know. Everybody thought that somebody would do the job that nobody did. I, I, you, know, you want to hire nobody. And you find that guy, you know, you get a lot of stuff done. Someone will say, of course they will, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that, that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. I mean, you put a kernel of seed in the ground, in your garden. You know, it's not a seed that comes up, okay? It's a plant that eventually will uh, bear fruit. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of the beasts, and another of fish, and another of birds. I mean, Paul understood something we have trouble understanding today, that man is a different type of flesh than animals. Continuing, there are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star. He's, he's got all these contrasts going, and then he goes into the difference between the mortality we experience today and the immortality to which we are raised in this first and better resurrection. Notice, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. It is a better resurrection, as I said, to an entirely different type of life. And for that we should be thankful. <clears throat> there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And then he makes the point. Verse 49, And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we also at this resurrection that is better, will bear the image of the heavenly man. You know, Paul does a, I mean, a, a, a great job. I mean, he, he contrasts the corruption that we experience today to the incorruption that life eternal will give us. He, he contrasts dishonor to glory and power to weakness. And... I mean, like I said, the capstone here really is the assertion, the promise, if you will, that as we now bear the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the heavenly man. This is not 
this is something that is not just described here in 1 Corinthians. Paul says essentially the same thing more concisely in Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> Verse 4, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also we shall walk in newness of life now. I mean, this is the, the, the interesting and also the inspiring thing, I think, about the principles of God in the Bible is they work now. Doesn't mean it's easy, but they work now. And we are simply practicing what we can more fully implement in the future. <clears throat> and so we are to walk in newness of life. Verse 5, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, through baptism, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection at this better resurrection to come. And then 1 John 3, verse 2. 1 John 3, here we have the Apostle John um, articulating, perhaps in a more direct way, what Paul described by contrast. Behold the manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. I mean, this whole business of children of God and brotherly love and all of those kinds of things uh, that, that are commonly expressed in Christianity um, has been, what's the word? It, it, it has been expressed so many times as a platitude that it too often loses its actual meaning. You know, now, if, if, if we were called the children of the royal family of Britain, for example, to name one of the oldest monarchies, I mean, look at the big fuss that has, the, the media has made of the recent marriage of Harry and the new princess that he found. That's a big deal, right? Because they are now children of the monarch twice removed from the throne because he would be in line after Prince William. That's a big deal. Why, why isn't it a big deal to be a child of God? It is a big deal. It's just that it's such a big deal that I think we have trouble actually grasping it. So John is trying to help us here. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now, now, right now, we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Like him? I mean, this is a really powerful statement that um, a German scholar, Johann Albrecht Bengel, makes no apologies for. And this is an old, um, a really, really old, I think Bengel lived in the 17th or 18th century and um, did studies on uh, New Testament Greek. And even to this day, he's still considered to be re the authority on the meaning of Greek. And here, here is his commentary on this. Quote, what we shall be, he's quoting, commenting on, on 1 John 3, verse 2. Further, by the power of this sonship, the what, by ep epistasis, emphatic edition, suggests something, and here's the, here's the essence of his commentary. This, what we shall be, suggests something unspeakable. Remember I said better is just inadequate? 
but it's maybe the best word um, to describe better. I mean, I don't know how you describe better, better than better, right? It's just better. How do you get better than better? Well, Bengal tried. Suggest something unspeakable contained in the likeness of God, which so exalts the sons of God that they become, quote, as it were, gods. This is from Bengal, page 796, New Testament Word Studies, published in 1971. It's a translation uh, into English. Daniel chapter 12 also describe, tries to describe what this new and better life is like. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth. Notice where they sleep. They don't sleep up in heaven. They sleep in the dust of the earth. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine. Like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. You know, you shine like, I mean, it is a, a, a life that emanates life, that dwells in light. I mean, I think there is a lot about light. I mean, we, we've done a really good job of studying the biology and the chemistry of the human body. Not so much, not so much light. I mean, a new, a new field of research now is looking at uh, biophotons. Um, the human brain has, an ex has exponentially more biophotons than animals, which might explain why a brain of similar size and capacity can do way more than animal brains. It's just beginning to study that in the last 10 or so years. But even beyond that, the better resurrection we are at, called to be lights today, are we not? In order that we are prepared to become lightning rods, um, for lack of a better term, um, in the future, in this resurrection to life. Revelation chapter 1. Remember we read in several locations that we shall be like him to bear his likeness the likeness of his resurrection. Revelation chapter 1 describes Jesus Christ in his glorified state. Verse 12, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, and girded about the chest was a golden band, and his head and his hair were white like wool and as white as snow, and his eyes like a flaming fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. I don't know if you've ever been to a steel mill or to a refinery where they refine brass and copper. And if you, if you open up that furnace and you look in there, it's like looking right into the sun. That's what Jesus Christ looked like. That's what you will look like if you're a participant in the better resurrection. Point number four. This resurrection is better because ultimately, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've been talking about being glorified, we've been talking about being first, and we've been talking about rulership. Now we have the fourth point, and this one's important on several levels, because it mitigates some of the tendencies, you know, that there are those who want to become kings and priests in the kingdom of God and are looking forward to have a rod of iron to knock knots on people's heads that they couldn't get along with. You know, you just, they, they come up in the resurrection and, you know, I've got a rod of iron. Whack! Not so fast. 
Point number four, it is better because ultimately it is not about its participants, us. It is about building a better world. Being in the first resurrection is better. There's no denying that. However, it is better for a very important reason, and that is that Christ, although he may not need us, has chosen to use individuals that he has called in order to together build a better world. And if we can't, if, if, if we think it is about anything else, we probably won't be there. Because when you read in Matthew chapter 25, on what the defining difference was and who went to the right and who went to the left. It got down to some pretty simple things. Food, water, and shelter. Clothing. I mean, the most basic needs of human beings that are necessary to build a better world. And if we're not prepared to do that, now <laughs> or in the future, according to Jesus Christ, you're not going to be there. You'll be in a different resurrection, one that is not quite as good. Revelation chapter 20. Notice, we'll read again. Verse 4, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. What do priests do? Well, maybe the better question is, what should priests do? I mean, if you go back and you look at history, Old Testament history in particular, even New Testament history, well, priests were called by God to serve, to teach, and to build people up. They've rarely filled that role. I mean, just look at the most recent news um, in, shall we say, a denomination that I will not name, where priests did precisely the opposite. The ultimate antithesis to service is abuse, now isn't it? You're not going to be a priest, I think I can say this with um, a pretty high degree of certainty. You're not going to be a priest reigning with Christ for a thousand years if you cannot pick up a cup of water and hand it to someone or pro provide some food. And I say that because, for two reasons. One is that that's the very example that Christ used in Matthew chapter 25. And two, the risen, resurrected Christ in all his glory manifested himself on a seashore of all places. And what did he do? He cooked breakfast for his disciples. Now, I'm a little bit challenged when it comes to cooking. You know, if granola is okay, and you know, I might be able to boil an egg, but I've been really spoiled. My mom was a good, good cook, and I have a wife that spoiled me for all 30-some some years. So I, I, I probably have some training to do, but I, I can get some water, and I know how to buy food. And I, I call up Susan. She's working a lot of hours. I said, Susan, you want me to cook tonight? You know what that means? We're going to a restaurant. <laughs> but I feed her, okay? I think, I think this, is, this is a really important point because if you, look at, if you look at what the prophecies describe at the beginning of the millennium, right after the glorious resurrection that we're describing, on what is necessary to do. It's pretty practical 
Fishermen going out and fishing people from behind rocks and clefts, hunters, they're described. I mean, when, when, when Jesus called his disciples and told them that he was going to make them fishers of men, I mean, that was not a New Testament idea. That was a prophecy uh, looking back to Jeremiah and looking forward to the future and what to do. You have to go find people because they're scared. Who wouldn't be scared after all those cataclysmic events? You leave the 99 and you go seek them out. There are houses to build. There are deserts to reclaim. There is a lot of practical work that needs done. And if you think that you're going to sit on a throne with an iron staff and knock knots on people's heads, you have the wrong idea. It's not what it's about. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 44. Ezekiel chapter 44. Beginning in verse 20. No priest shall drink wine when he enters the inner court. Why was that even necessary to mention? <laughs> you think about it. The priests were getting drunk in a temple. They shall not take as a wife a widow or a divorced woman, but take virgins of the descendants of the house of Israel or widows of the priests. And then in verse 23, and they shall teach my people, this is projecting into the future, they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy, and cause them to discern between unclean and the clean. You just let that think in, sink in for a few minutes. Will that change the world? I mean, today we don't differentiate between, everything's okay, except when it's different from when the people that say everything is okay, and then it's not okay. And isn't that interesting? You know, we have, if, if you want to meet a really intolerant person, go talk to someone who is what I'm going to call a high priest of tolerance and disagree with them. You know, oh, we tolerate everything. We, um, what did I just see? Um, a North Carolina school is already having, they only teach history from 1870 forward. Why do you think that is? Yeah. Civil War ended in 1865. Um, I mean, the, the <laughs> I mean, history is important. If you don't know the mistakes of the past, you're doomed to make them again. I mean, there was a distinction in this country between right and wrong that was based to a certain extent on the Bible. And the reason it was based to a certain extent on the Bible is because they had nothing else to read. They didn't have Facebook. You know, they didn't have all kinds. They didn't have the Daily Mail. They didn't have all the news sites. They had the Bible and a candle. You know, what are you going to do? You read the Bible. And that influences, influenced a differentiation between right and wrong. And America, for all its faults, and believe me, there are many, what, here's the undeniable fact. The undeniable fact is that because, to a certain extent, we differentiated between the clean and the unclean and the difference, as we're going to read, and we had it based on laws, 
became the most influential country in the history of the world. That's just a fact. We've done more good on a humanitarian level than any other country in the history of the world, and I challenge anybody to provide facts that that is not true. And it was just an example in a small way of why things get better when you do some of these things. Verse 23, and they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. In controversy, they shall stand as judges and judge it according to my judgments. They shall keep my laws, my statutes, and all my appointed meetings, and they shall hallow my Sabbath. It's about building a better world. Now, I was just looking at the calendar. Um, trumpets, which I'm kind of talking about today, is a week from Monday. This following Monday, we have Labor Day. So it's superb. For the next five weeks, we've got four-day weeks. Our employees love it. They think it's great. It also can be uh, a bit of a challenge. But if we hallow Sabbath, there is obviously an intellectual benefit to do that because of the focus of God, but there's also a physical benefit, right? It's also a physical benefit. It, it will build a better world. Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. Verse 19. By the way, today is my birthday. I guess you can preach for your birthday. Um, I got some great, um, if you go back and look, I got a phone call this morning. I had actually forgotten that it was my birthday. I woke up, was doing, getting ready for my sermon. I, think, I never, never gave it a thought. Susan, you know, she's old and forgetful too. She never mentioned it. Um, I, now I'm in real trouble. Um, <laughs> I, I'm as old as her now, right? You're all looking at me. How is he going to get himself out of that? Well, I'm, I'm not. I'm just going to take it. Um, so I got the first, the first time I realized that I had a birthday today is when I got a phone call from Massachusetts. And, you know, they're all telling me about my birthday. And then I got two cards back there that, you know, the kids can explain to you. I'm an old guy now. Really old. So I'm not going to be around you know, forever. It's pretty clear. See, I've got to get back to the sermon here. Isaiah chapter 30, would you please go there quickly? Verse 19, for the people shall dwell in Sion at Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. I mean, this sounds very different from a king of this world, doesn't it? And how many politicians other than during the election cycle, really listen to you and are gracious to you at the sound of your cry. And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teachers will not be moved into a corner anymore, but your eyes shall see your teachers. Your ears shall hear a word behind you say, this is the way, walk in it, whenever you turn to the right hand or turn to the left. And you will, also, you, you will also defile the covering of your graven image of silver and the ornament of your molded images of gold, and you will throw them away as an unclean thing, and you will say, get away. Then he will give the rain for your seed with which you sow the ground and the bread of the increase of the earth. It will be fat and plenteous in the day that your cattle will feed in large pastures. Likewise, the oxen and the young donkeys that work the ground will eat cured fodder, which has been winnowed with the shovel and fan. It's about building a better world. And you know what? It'll just keep getting better and better and better as the meaning of the fall holy days 
continue to unfold. Back to Texas. Mr. Dick had a simple request for his funeral. It was a much smaller funeral than the one I attended yesterday, but no less meaningful. A song that he had remembered from childhood was to be sung. It was a message to his family, actually. A song that, if it did not shape his life, certainly characterized the way he lived it. But on that day of, the day of his funeral, it was more a message to those that remain than a eulogy about his life. Perhaps you will remember it, too. The song is entitled, Dare to Be a Daniel. And it has been a pop popular among children's choirs down through a long time. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. But I will read the lyrics because I think it instructs us on what we should to be doing as we prepare for a better resurrection. <clears throat> Standing by a purpose true, heeding God's command. Honor them, the faithful few, all hail to Daniel's band. There to be a Daniel, there to stand alone, there to have a purpose firm, there to make it known. I mean, Daniel set such a wonderful example of standing alone. Many mighty men are lost, daring not to stand. Who for God could have been a host by joining Daniel's band? Hold the gospel banner high, on to victory grand. Satan and his host defy and shout for Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, and dare to make it known. Radic attained to that victory grand and now awaits the better resurrection. May his final wish serve as an inspiration for us to stay the course and not become one of the mighty that was lost because we dared not to stand. In short, may it inspire us to dare to be a Daniel as we continue our journey toward a better resurrection.